Welcome to these Travel Times talks here at the Adventure Overland Show 2017. Uh, these are brought to you in partnership with Rimmer Brothers, who have a vast array of aftermarket OEM and genuine parts for all Land Rover vehicles at competitive prices. More importantly to you guys, they will deliver them all around the world fast. So if you have any problems, these are the places to come to. There's now a brand new accessories catalogue out with a comprehensive range of Land Rover vehicles from Range Rover Classics up to, well, vehicles of today. There's also the popular parts catalogue and this is a great accessory to put in your glove box. For more details, do visit the website at rimmerbrothers.co.uk. Enjoy the talk. Thank you very much indeed for coming along. If you're here for the presentation about South America, you're in the right place. For those of you here for the parachute packing, sorry, different, different place. Okay, I hope you enjoy the presentation. We're going to be about 25 minutes just giving you some input about our experiences in South America, and then there's plenty of time for questions and answers afterwards. Um, on the program, it kind of builds it as something about personal security, and I think there's some breakdown in communication because there is an element about personal security in there. Um, that's not all it's about. <clears throat> I'll probably better explain what the Mr. Meldrew thing's about. Um, I'm not Mr. Meldrew, I'm Paul, and my other half is Marilyn. And uh, just to prove we're not grumpy, there we are in, in, uh, in South America. It's Christmas time and we've decorated the cacti with, uh, with some blue baubles. So the presentation's got a number of elements to it. One of them is personal security. The other one is around yeah, what's in South America, is it worth going? Um, is my vehicle suitable? What happens if my vehicle breaks down? And those are the things that people seem to worry about most of all. I must say, this is not a presentation to try and um, showcase South America. If it was, I'd have completely different photographs. I'm on a bit of a mission, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm honest. Um, the Mr. Meldrew thing comes from one evening at a campsite. We were parked up there, and I think nine other trucks came in. They didn't know each other. They were all travelling independently. They were all German or Swiss. And we travelled for five months before we saw another Brit. At the port in Montevideo, where we took the vehicle, I said to the handler, oh, hi, hello, we're from England. And um, people swarmed all over us to look at the truck and look at us and kind of almost touch us. I said, what's all this about? He said, oh, in 14 years I've been doing this, you're the second lot to come through. Hundreds, maybe thousands of Germans and Swiss have been through. And this was repeated all the way around South America. So at campsites, campsite owners would go, wow, somebody from Great Britain. And... Uh, it really is a shame that we're not over there, so I'm on a bit of a mission, and I found myself screaming, I don't believe it, as the ninth German vehicle came, came rolling in. So um, if at the end of this presentation you think, yeah, do you know what, South America, I think I'll put it on, on my shopping list, I, I'll be so happy, because it really is very, very easy. And, um, well, let's, do, let's roll through the presentation, hope to see if I can convince you. I'm not a travel agent or paid for by the South American government, so I must have... Okay, um, whoa, somehow the computer's managed to gobble that image. There we go, there should be a little map of South America just to make sure we're all orientated and in the right place. Oh, there it is. Okay, so it's the green bit there, we're all talking about the right place. Uh, could I just have, have a quick show of hands? How many people are kind of tempted to go to South America? Whoa, fantastic, okay, that's good. There's the list of countries that we managed to hit in well, about six months of driving and eight months over there. So it's Uruguay, Argentina, Chile, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, Bolivia, southern Brazil, because Brazil's huge, Paraguay, bits of Paraguay, bit of a story there, and the Galapagos Islands. So we're not experts, we're just two ordinary people who've got in a fairly ordinary vehicle and gone for a drive around. On the left-hand side, I'm not sure how well you can see it at the back, but there's a screenshot there from Maps Me. Everybody can nod in, everybody's got, everybody's got Maps Me as an app? Yeah. If you haven't, you can't travel without it. It works offline. Oh my God, it's the one app you've got to have. And I think um, my lovely other half has got a list of indispensable apps, which you put at the back there. But please don't travel without Maps Me. Incredible. It maps Me. Free, you'd be offline in the middle of South America and you zoom right down to house level. How good's that? And there's a list of apps and some photos of our trip, very amateur photos up at the back. Yeah, yeah. If, if you want a bit of a kind of photo fest, there's, there's some at the back. And we've got to say, we didn't intend to do a presentation. We thought, absolutely not. We don't want to do any presentations, no websites, no blogs or anything. We just wanted to travel. 
But then, it, I'm sorry, everything's been taken with a mobile phone, I apologize. Um, so, we, we just found ourselves saying, come on, we've got to do something to convince people to go. Hence that I don't believe it. And there we are. Um, if you're close in, you'll see that selection of German vehicles. There's a whole sort of things there. Unimogs, Land Rovers, you name it. In fact, at one point in Argentina, at a very nice remote camping place, there was like a village of German vehicles. They'd all plotted up there. We parked about a mile away because the Brexit thing had happened. It was all a bit difficult. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we did by some miracle see some uh, motorised overlanders, some Brits. Uh, they got off the boat that our van got off, and I'll talk about the boats in a minute. Complete miracle, absolute one in a thousand thousand chance. Uh, a guy in a sprinter, four wheel drive, and a venerable Honda motorcycle. We didn't see them again because it's a big continent, you zip off there. But the guy in the sprinter, um, when I was chatting to Tom about doing this presentation, I messaged him. He was on the other side of the continent, and I said, Come on, what's your one bit of advice? We're both on the road in South America. What should I say to the folks over here? And his message, I won't put the expletives in, but it said, tell them to stop talking about the effing locking rear differentials. Just get in the vehicle and drive over here. And I, I think he's got a point, actually, because we do, and I'm guilty of this, get very obsessive about the vehicle preparation and all the kit you need. Uh, when I, in actual fact, you can do it in a, you know, a very simple, almost inadequate vehicle. <coughs> Other Brits we met up in Ecuador. Uh, these are lovely doctors from Scotland. They've gone on their bicycles and they've adopted a dog. You can see the cage on the back. That was, that was nice to meet them. Uh, we made their day because we had a spare tin of Heinz beans. So after, I think, yeah, a year on the road, they were pleased to get some Heinz beans. Um, some other people, and these are just fantastic English eccentrics. If anybody knows them, Phoebe and Harriet, uh, they're cycling around the world. They cycle across <laughs> South America and uh, their, their mother and daughter and I said, your bicycle looks really interesting. What's that all about? She said, oh, it's my shopping bicycle. I've had it for 17 years. I thought I'd just get on it and ride. And actually, she's got a point. You don't need some really flash kit. As long as your passion is for traveling and you get moving, it, somehow it all takes care of itself. OK, so why do we go to South America? What's all that about? Well, you'll be driving past scenes like this, these beautiful indigenous costumes, street markets, a kind of completely different world away from where we are. And I'm just going to run through a few slides now just to try and hopefully whet your appetite as to, um, as to what you might see over there. We do have a technological apology. Uh, we did have a three minute video loop which will show you some heart stopping, kind of stomach wrenching roads. You know, we're driving along the edge of cliffs, we've got a four wheeler vehicle, only three and a half of the wheels are on the road, that kind of thing. Um, but if you come around to the van later on, we can probably play it for you. You can have a look at that sort of stuff. <laughs> Marilyn said she wasn't sure if it would put people off, but being a bloke, I was like, yeah, bring it on. <laughs> okay, so you've got these lovely um, street scenes. Other, other delights, this is the border um, between Peru and Bolivia. And as you can see, it's kind of rain logged. There are only bicycles. We were there for an hour and a half doing the paperwork. No other vehicles went through. And then it turned into a, like a muddy, rutted track afterwards. I mean, just completely fascinating. People carrying mattresses on bicycles to avoid the customs and tax and whatever. And, and every border crossing is just a complete adventure in itself, really. And apologies to those people who are South America experts here. You'll, you'll probably go, yeah, I know that, but no. <laughs> OK. Uh, what other joys do you have over there? Well, if you're overlanding, obviously you take your hotel with you. And this is in a beautiful national park uh, down in Chile. And there are icebergs on the lake. The hotel costs 300 US dollars per night. We stayed in the car park. <laughs> we, took, we took some nice clothes with us. We paid seven pounds for the cup of coffee. Thank you very much indeed. Settled ourselves down, which kind of like established our credentials, nip in and out the hotel and use their facilities. It was beautiful, absolutely wonderful. Um, other delights, uh, having this camp next to your van at Cayman. That's in Brazil. Uh, they're quite safe. We we're three metres above the water, so apparently it wasn't going to run out of the water and eat us. That's a good thing. <coughs> Oddities like this, Peruvian hairless dog. I'm sorry this is not a David Attenborough kind of showcase of South America, but I'm passionate about these things. Hairless dogs, they're one of the most intelligent creatures around. It's just little things like that that make your day. Uh, they guard ancient sites, you know, the kind of Inca sites, the ruins of amazing animals. Um, some culinary delights. Here we go. Inca Cola and Coca Cola. So, anybody here from Scotland, if you're missing your iron brew and you're over in, um, in South America, don't worry. Inca Cola is a dead ringer for iron brew. And I'm sorry the two are sold together, but the big corporate Coca Cola went and bought up Inca Cola, which is quite sad, really. 
<clears throat> other culinary delights. This is the Atacama Desert. We've got a bag of crisps there, which is just about to try and explode because of the lack of atmospheric pressure. It's really quite unnerving, really. You think, oh my God, how explosive power is inside that bag of crisps. Will it explode in my face? Um, what else? Other next culinary delight is being able to pick bananas from out of your cab. Um, that's in southern Brazil. And uh, you probably won't be able to read this at the back, so I'll, I'll read it out for you. <laughs> it's probably better in Spanish than English, isn't it? Spicy lamb testicles at 6,900. Wonderful. But seriously, um, South America is an amazing place. This is a campsite in Argentina. There's nobody else running a mile around. So we've got the sea out in front of us with whales in there. And look at the sunset. Fantastic. And uh, quite easy to drive to in a two-wheel drive vehicle. And safe. It's in a national park with access control. And we can talk about safety later. Other joys here, and apologies for the washed out picture, but the sunlight was so bright there in the Atacama Desert. Um, we're driving on uh, sand roads there. And all of a sudden, the road just finished with a six-foot dip, which even four-wheel drives had struggled to get through and got themselves stuck. So South America always provides you these little surprises. No warning, nothing at all. Um, some comedy moments. There we are, trying to find Ecuador's most wonderful highest volcano, only to find when we camp there overnight, we're waiting for the spectacular view, we get thick fog. And the sat-nav wasn't much help either. That was showing a kind of very unsympathetic grey background. But just interesting there about the sat-nav, I'm just... Come back to this point again about how easy it is to get around South America. That's an ordinary Garmin, ordinary Garmin, um, with a SD card shoved in the side. I can't remember, it's 60 or 80 quid. Fantastic, all the details there. Just plug in your latitude and longitude. Obviously, they haven't got any postcodes. And uh, off you go. Didn't let us down. And uh, really impressive. Having said that, some countries probably don't even survey their own roads, let alone supply the data to Garmin. So Bolivia probably not much help at all, but uh, there we go. Um, <clears throat> roads, you can find yourself driving on roads like this for days on end along the sides of cliffs, which is great joy. Um, that's two-way, by the way. It does concentrate the mind a bit. And other surprises, uh, we didn't have any traffic jams other than this one in Lima, which was following some very serious disorder. And you can see there's some sort of burning tires and rocks still on the ground, so it's just returning to normality. But even then, it didn't feel you know, threatening. Um, I probably ought to point out, <clears throat> if you think this guy's a bit, a bit of a loon, can I go into a riot situation not feeling worried about it? My background uh, is, has been as a cop, uh, police officer for 30 years, uh, as a response officer, and with a particular interest in personal security, and I've done briefings and trainings for people who are kind of doing frontline deployments in the Middle East. So I didn't, I missed the, um, oh, the, the session about personal security. I'd love to have gone to that, but I'm sure there were some very good techniques there I advised about how to assess risk. And I'm sorry I haven't got time here to cover a lot of that stuff, but if anybody wants to cover any of that, I'm more than happy afterwards we can talk about personal one-to-one -one security, how you'd assess situations and the countermeasures you might take. But if you want to pull it all into a nutshell, there are probably two things. One is distance. If somebody looks a bit dodgy, keep your distance between them. If a town or a favela or an area looks really dodgy, keep away from it. So distance, distance, distance. And the second one is this inbuilt thing that we've all got, those kind of spidery sensors on the back of your neck. You think, oh, this is not quite right. That's your kind of 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years life experience. And I don't like this. Listen to it and, and do something about it. OK, well, let's get down to the, uh, the questions that people ask and see if we can reassure you. Uh, the first one is, how hard can it be? Oops, for some reason it's, it's not displaying. Hi, guys in the back there, techie guys. Is the... Uh, the word's not coming out on the screen. Okay. So the first question people ask is, uh, isn't it dangerous? Isn't it difficult to get there? Um, what if I don't speak Spanish? Uh, is my vehicle suitable? And um, what if my vehicle breaks down? Okay. Um, so isn't it dangerous? So, so for some reason the computer's managed to gobble a few words, but we're okay. So is it dangerous? No, it's absolutely not. Uh, in this, I think that, well, we agree the most dangerous thing is the hospitality of South Americans. So here we are in Colombia, and a local family and some indigenous people have kind of adopted us and given us a big hug, and really looked after us in a way that you wouldn't get in the UK. And that hospitality is quite outstanding. And it's worth saying that uh, eventually 
we acclimatize to what's over there and what we perceive to be dangerous. So for example, when we arrived in Montevideo, which is very much like a European town, very up together, feels very European, a friend took us out in, in his car to go out to a local garage, um, which was just checking out, we, yeah, would we take our van there? As we went on this journey, we left the conurbation of Montevideo and went out through some kind of really quite rough areas. I looked at Marilyn, Marilyn looked at me and I said, oh dear God, in two days we've got to drive through here, we'll die, we'll die, you know, if we break down and have a puncture, they'll just kill us, it'll be horrible, you know, I just, please dear God, don't let us break down here. Anyway, we drove around South America, we came back to Montevideo, kind of like six months later, we drove through the same area and went, oh wow, you know, if you broke down here, these people would just be so wonderful, just, you'd be fighting them off to help you, you know. <laughs> And it really is just about acclimatizing and understanding the different levels of poverty and what lies behind those doors. And generally, it's a friendly welcome. Yeah, that like being killed by kindness or being killed by a suicide shower. Um, this is a slightly whimsical presentation, but in all seriousness, for me, electricity and water do not mix that well. And all over South America, you'll find these showers which you can buy for five pounds in a supermarket. They love them. Uh, this one, unbelievably, is plugged into the wall. Generally, everything is fastened up with bits of um, plastic tape. So many a times I've taken an ambient shower, I've looked at it and thought, no way, no way. Um, other odd hazards. Um, a capybara, there we are, the world's biggest rodent up here, tried to eat our van. And it did actually try and eat it. Not the rubber, not the plastic, it wanted to eat the metal bits. And there it is, um, eating the wheel nuts. And it had to go at the suspension nuts as well. And I've got a video of me trying to train this thing not to do that. Complete epic fail, we moved the van, I have to say. Um, what else do you get that's different over there? Well, there are guns everywhere, and you kind of got to get you got to get used to that. Um, personally, I'm comfortable around guns. Um, it's the people that, you know, are actually holding them that are the problem. But here we are, Montevideo, Uruguay, a very civilised area, but there's a cash in transit delivery there, the yellow van. You see the guy, the guy on the, leaning on the corner of the building? He's wearing a three-piece suit carrying a pump-action shotgun. And you kind of get used to it. You go to a grocery store somewhere and the old boy sat doing security is packing a little revolver or something. And um, as we drove to one campsite in Argentina, I, I don't mean to put you off now, but this did actually happen. It was the worst campsite we've ever been to. I would describe it as like Chernobyl. And we went through this horrible industrial area to get there. And as we drove there, I found myself to South Saint to Marilyn. I hope the security here is packing something useful, because I don't want to see them packing just a you know, revolver or something. I want something serious here. When we got there, there was a young girl there with a Glock self-loading pistol and two magazines. I thought, oh yeah, we're okay here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, which kind of, kind of bring, brings us on to the biggest gang in town, the police. I've got a particular interest in that. I'm passionate about police being professional and all the rest of it. And um, in a simple terms, keep away from the old bill. They're not like the old bill we have, have over here um, for, for many, many reasons. This is, these are police in Colombia. They're doing a bit of shopping around the local market. And you'll see they've got a kind of fully automatic kind of you know, assault rifles and whatever. And bless them, they're out on foot patrol with a rocket launcher, general purpose machine gun, all that sort of stuff. The reason is they're just returned to normality after some very serious disorder. And Colombia is incredibly safe. The Foreign and Commonwealth Office will provide you with advice and a colour-coded map of where you can and can't go. So basically the green route, straight up, that's safe, goes a bit amber off there, go a bit further into red areas, that's where the gorillas were or are. And um, generally stick to the tourist route, you'll be absolutely fine. Probably one of the safest places you, know, you, you could probably expect in many ways. Um, I, I like to think of personal security and risk in a holistic sense. So people go, oh God, South America, we're all gonna die, what's gonna happen to us? Actually, probably drinking a dodgy glass of water that could really mess you up. And the other thing is slips, trips and falls. Uh, we met quite a few people who were in casts, casts, plasters or whatever, because the pavement terrain isn't like over here. And we're still in that Western mindset where we think we can walk and look at something and then, bam, a hole gets us. And poor Marilyn managed to come to a, a whole, uh, broken ankle in Bolivia. And um, it was a very poor village. There were no taxis around. They didn't have any cars, only motorcycle taxis. But motorcycle taxis and a broken ankle are not a very good mix. Okay, let's look at the other. Now, this is a serious uh, hazard here: is the driving. Um, I, have, I have to say, nothing on earth prepared me for the standard of driving over there. We drove about seventeen thousand miles through, uh, well, through all sorts of terrain up and down the Andes, and we must have passed I don't know 
thousands, tens of thousands of shrines, roadside shrines, deaths. And I would estimate the road death rate, and it's very hard to calculate, is probably somewhere around 50 to 100 times higher than here. Okay. I mean, it really is seriously a very, obviously a very high death rate. We saw uh, one or two probably fatal bits and pieces. So it's all about driving defensively, you know, hanging back, all those techniques, keeping it, keeping out of danger. <clears throat> but I'll put you this slide up here just to give you an example of it. Here we've got a coach. Remember, we're a right-hand drive here. So this coach, a public service vehicle full of people, is overtaking on a right-hand bend, which is obviously a blind bend as you go in there. So there it is. Yep, Brrr, I'm off we go. And the next one, yes, see, you're still going into that right-hand bend. Oh, yes, yeah. And you see we've got, even got people working on the right-hand side. You know, if you've passed, got on your driving test, you say, oh, my God, there's a load of hazards here. We're all going to die. But that driver thought it was absolutely fine to go and overtake on a blind bend. And in Bolivia, um, they, well, in some places, get their car blessed by the local priest. Game on, you can drive however you want them. And there is a pecking order around vehicles, which you need to understand if you feel comfortable over there. The first one is that coaches, amazingly, with 52 people on board, are at the top of the list. They can drive at anything. So basically, if something's smaller than you, it has to move out of the way. You just drive at it. And you think, oh, I can't be right. Um, Colombian drivers are completely crackers. And our introduction to Colombia was a coach driving at a police van. Just drove straight at it. There's no problems. The police van had to swerve off into the dirt. There's no waving of fists or anything like that. That's just the deal. That's the way it is. Um, so those of you who are in big trucks, respect. You'll be fine. Okay, next thing I've got is, isn't it difficult to get there? Apologies for the lack of text on here. Um, this is a screenshot from uh, Seabridge. They're a German company. They've moved thousands of motorhomes over to South America and all around the world. Um, pretty straightforward. It's 385 euros per meter length. We shipped ours from Antwerp to Montevideo. It's cheaper on the way back because they calculate the cost um, by the volume and you pay in dollars. So with a few port fees, you're looking at a couple of grand, that sort of thing. Well, it's better value than go on the ferry to France or to Iceland for that matter. So Seabridge, uh, we'll, I think we've got the, uh, the details up there. The service they provide is absolutely first class and it's pretty straightforward. Um, Drive your vehicle over to Antwerp. A little bit of Belgium customs, a bit of Belgium formality. They stick a sticker on the front wing of your, um, your, your van with a barcode on, and hopefully it says the name of the port where you want to go. In the case of the uh, journey to South America, it's four weeks down the coast of West Africa, and there's some interesting security arrangements there, which I won't go into. Um, next thing is you jump on an aeroplane. Uh, the little cow there is Mr. Moo. Sorry, he goes everywhere with us. He's a very naughty toy cow. He just kind of takes sn cheeky snapshots around the world. Sorry, it's really meant for our grandchildren. And um, your van arrives in Montevideo. And I include this next shot for sheer comedy value. This is an introduction to South America. I'm taking this through the security fence onto the port. I have been waiting for my vehicle to arrive, and uh, it's like being in a delivery room. It's worse, you know. Oh, God, will it arrive? What will be missing? Will it be smashed to pieces? But it's there. It's actually on the quay in the sunshine in Montevideo. But there are about, I don't know, up to half a dozen dock workers swarming around my vehicle. They're on a forklift truck. They're raising it up, trying to get in the top, have a look around it, trying all the doors and everything. And I'm just like, oh dear God, this is South America. They're just going to tear it apart like locusts. So in my rudimentary Spanish, I kind of shout across at them. And um, I'm ready for ripping the bars, the gate, you know, the, the gate open. And they kind of wave back. I said, oh God, what's happening here? The truth of it is, they're just childlike and curious. And we, with our kind of western suspicious type mind I was thinking the worst they're just totally curious they just want to have a look at it they've never seen one before and that, that's important to remember that everything you wear every single thing your vehicle everything with it you can't buy it over there you are a walking source of curiosity so nobody really means you any harm having said that around security um, people will try the doors on your vehicle and it's nothing personal it's basically if you don't lock it up we'll take it nothing personal that's all it is and the worst thing was at borders and frontier posts the only people hanging around the vehicle are the police and the customs officers and it's like well yeah you know we'll take it <laughs> so slightly different mindset but generally generally 
very, very well-intentioned and lovely people. Another issue, I'm going to do a bit of, a bit of a Victor Meldrew here. Um, five people there. We figured that the average ratio of workers was about five people to do the work, work of one person over here. I'm sorry any South Americans in the room, but really the level of efficiency is that low. It took seven people in a coffee shop 25 minutes to serve us a cup of coffee one day. It's incredibly laid back, which is beautiful because it does have its benefits, but sometimes you know, it can be mad maddening. You think, God, a child of seven could reorganise this customs border process. You could do it in five minutes. There's a, there's a two-mile tailback of trucks, and they go, oh, you know, well, who cares? You know, I'm stamping my bit of paper, they're stamping their bit of paper, and eventually you get into the swing of it, which kind of comes on to the local vibe, the local feel, and the language. So what if I don't speak Spanish? Well, um, so there should be some fonts up there, which I'll just run through. The first thing is, uh, as an English speaker, you know 3,517 words of Spanish. How brilliant is that? It's amazing. Once you kind of switch off from English and you're totally thinking in Spanish and reading, seeing everything in Spanish, all of a sudden you go, oh God, is this my, my proper language? Because I recognize that word, that word, that word. It's, it's quite uncanny, really. And it's probably different to being in Spain for a week or two weeks on holiday. All of a sudden, it's kind of, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm kind of absorbing a bit of this. Um, the other fantastic thing about South America, and I truly, truly love this, is the pronunciation. You know how Spanish is a bit difficult with all that th 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 and all that sort of stuff? There's none of that in South America. You pronounce it exactly how it is, and you can have a very, very strong Yorkshire accent, for example. Dos severs a por favor, you know. And, oh yeah, two beers, they, you know, it, would, it would happen. Um, so, it really is quite easy. There are free apps. Uh, that's a screenshot from Duolingo. Um, highly recommended. I think we've got it written down at the back. So Duolingo, um, 10 minutes a day on that, and you'd be amazed how many words you'll pick up. For some reason, they seem to hammer the word crab and rabbit and random things like that. So when we went to the Galapagos Islands, we were fine for like random marine animals. You know that. OK, um, in all seriousness, language, how do you pick it up? So this is a trip to the loo. All right, you're inside the loo cubicle, and there is a laminated piece of paper that says, basically, don't chuck the toilet paper down the toilet. And to start off with, you think, oh, gosh, what does it all say? But there's a word, papel hygienico. Papel sounds a bit like paper. Hygienico sounds a bit like hygienic. OK, so toilet paper. Mm -hmm. OK. Go to the next toilet. Um, please don't put your pa paper down the toilet. Put it in the bin. And the same word crops up, papel hygienico, toilet paper. Well, there you are. You've gone for two Ps, and you've, you know, you've learned two words. So uh, The next one is a little walk down the street, and on the left-hand side is a, a picture of a pickup truck. You know you're in Uruguay because it's got a, um, a water container on top of the roof, and that is the sign that you're trying to sell your vehicle. And um, in the window of the vehicle, which you can't, probably, can't read at the back, at the back, is a sign that says paraventa, um, for sale. But if you wouldn't know that, you think, okay, 50 yards down the road is an exchange bureau, and it's got two lines of numbers for each of the currencies, Compra and Venta. Okay, well, the Venta is higher than Compra, so that must be the sale rate. And all of a sudden, you've learned the word, the verb to sell. Mm, okay. You don't look too convinced, but anyway. Incidentally, whilst we're on there, I look at the exchange rate for the Argentinian currency, 1.545, 2.65 to sell. Nobody wants the stuff. In fact, talking of Argentina, here we go. They're very, very helpful around language tuition. So kind of them. This is a shot of a road just outside of Shwaya, right at the very bottom of um, yeah, Patagonia down there. And there's the sign, Las Malvinas and Argentinas. The Falkland Islands are Argentinian. <laughs> oh, yes. And you go into the country, there'll be this big sign. And wherever you go on the road, there'll be sign after sign. And... Um, that's the backstory to that. We feel it's quite sad because the country is in many ways falling apart and this almost bogus, phony war about the Falklands is used to distract the, the general public. Yeah, the, the roads are falling apart, the infrastructure's rubbish, and yet they put all these glittery signs everywhere. And it's quite sad, really. Um, other road signs. This is in the Atacama Desert. I'm not quite sure why we took this, but it's quite interesting. At the top, there's a bit missing, but it says Ruta del Desierto. So Ruta sounds a bit like root, desierto, desierto, yeah, that sounds like desert. Tropico de Capricornio, fantastic. Tropic de Capricorn, that's easy. And the bottom, deserts and archaeology. So even without reading any Spanish, all of a sudden you can crack that. And if you are in a bit of trouble, just shout at people, stick an O on the end, so necesito, mecanico, I need a mechanic, you've got it sorted. 
And I, I'm, I'm making light of this, but it is important probably just to learn a little bit of Spanish, because if you don't, you can end up with one or two little problems, and this is one of the problems you could have if you don't understand the menu. It, uh, a fried guinea pig. Um, if you are going over there, C-U-Y. Look for that on the menu. Don't go for it. Right, what have we got next? Yeah, and we're vegetarians, right? Any veggies here? Oh, you can have such comedy moments in South America, it's absolutely brilliant. Okay. Right, that says, is, is my vehicle suitable? And underneath I put, ha ha. Um, yeah, of course your vehicle's suitable. That's a, a typical German Panzerwagen. I mean, the, you know, I don't want to start this debate about whose vehicle's best. They've all got advantages and disadvantages, but that is a kind of, you know, high-end German vehicle. Um, it's not for me. Uh, lots of villages it won't get round, lots of tunnels it won't get round, lots of little tiny roads I've been on that it won't get round. But I guess it can go out, up into the mountains where, you know, where, where our vehicle can't go. And, it, and it's horses for courses, really. Having said all that, that's what the locals drive around in quite often. Just a knackered 20-year-old Japanese car, and that will get you through anything. That will get you through deserts, through swamps, up mountains. That's what they drive. And so we've got all this beautiful kit out here. Uh, but when it comes to it, a lot of it's just basic two-wheel drive vehicles. And I, you, have, you have to accept that when it's really swampy, really muddy, a bad season, probably nothing moves. But do like the locals, just drive around it or just sit and drink beer for a couple of days till it dries up. Um, there's another local vehicle, a uh, Toyota bus. Goodness knows how old it is. But it's two-wheel drive and that carries pigs, chickens and everything. But look, look at the ground clearance on it. That is the key. That is really what... It works over there, I think, with the, with the bad road surfaces, and a good departure angle at the back. And this is just a quick shot from a road in Ecuador. Um, the road surface got a bit sketchy, doing a bit of road works and other things happening. But I thought it was just interesting. There's a, um, a two-wheel drive tanker. I think it's an LPG tanker, gas tanker. Obviously a motorcycle on standard tyres. A two-wheel drive pickup. They're big on two-wheel drive pickups over there and a two-wheel drive delivery van, and us in a two-wheel drive uh, box van, um, perhaps a panel van. So a lot of stuff does get around even though, even though it's two-wheel drive. Uh, if you're thinking about size, this is a quick aerial shot from a cable car in La Paz uh, in Bolivia, and just looking down. You can just see how chaotic the traffic is there. Sorry, at the back it probably looks like little white ants running around or something, but. Um, yeah, yeah, a big vehicle, I guess, could be quite stressful sometimes in, a, you know, in, in some environments. Having said that, big four-wheel drive vehicles have their advantages. So this is on the edge of um, a volcano in, in Chile. I have to confess, two-wheel drive, I went up there on, on this black kind of volcanic stuff and went, OK, right, I think I better turn around here. So we did a kind of 72-point turn and came back. Whereas in a four-wheel drive, you'll probably have ploughed on and been quite happy. But in, um, in all seriousness, that is probably the, the worst kind of road surface you could generally expect. Right, it's a lot of corrugations in a lot of areas. It will try and destroy your vehicle. It will make the Myra test strike. Yeah, we have up here in the UK look like a bit of a joke. But generally, an ordinary vehicle with a bit of um, ground clearance will get you through there. Um, the next question the computer's gobbled is, uh, what if my vehicle breaks down? And I would say, relax, you'll be fine. And our bus, bush mechanic guy's just gone out there and he'll go, no, you won't, you need to come to me for a three-day course. And actually, he's probably right. I think I might go and see him. But um, we did 17,000 miles. We didn't have one problem. Absolutely nothing. Um, because a lot of it's about preventative maintenance. And here we are in northern Peru. This is a bus garage, which was recommended to us by somebody. Uh, does everybody here use iOverlander? iOverlander? Yeah, I'm getting some nods. Okay, do not <laughs> leave the country without iOverlander. Um, you know, good garages that green goes, that us travellers see, fine. Yeah, they're, they're marked on there. And this was one of them. It was a bus garage, and the bus on the left, believe it or not, uses the same chassis as our vehicle, a Type 2 Mercedes. So... Um, I was a bit dubious about this. I knew I needed an oil change and just a bit of a fettle and a bit of a grease up. So we drove in there on a Saturday morning and I thought, well, this is um, South America. Yeah, I'd be like, ah, buenos dias, how are you? And we'll have to do all the chat and it'll never go anywhere. And they'll say, come back on Tuesday. And you go, okay. So we rolled in there and so we explained what we needed. And he went, yeah, yeah. Beckoned us over. Switched the engine off, yeah. No sooner we'd done that, 
the vehicle's kind of jacked up and moving, the sump plug's out, the oil, the oil's kind of coming out. In 55 minutes, three mechanics had serviced the vehicle, washed it, and we were back on the road, all using top quality genuine components and using top quality uh, oils, semi synthetic. The labour rate? Three pounds an hour. Uh, that's not typical, you know, that's not typical, but it's, it, it proves what is possible. And the most important thing for me was um, our local garage, I won't name them, but they are just a nightmare. Every time we go in there, the Mercedes specialist, they manage to wreck the vehicle one way or another, so we're never going there again. These guys work on those all the time. So behind me was a guy with a gearbox stripped. You know, he looked about 16, he's quickly putting it all back together. And they rebuild things. They are proper engineers, they're not technicians. And that is it's very heartening. Um, you can get some, obviously, some backstreet funny comedy experiences. This is in Argentina. And um, you probably can't see the girly calendars at the back, it's probably a blessing. But, you know, you kind of think, have I gone back to the 1970s? You know, there's a bloke with a fag out and a gas supply there. You think, oh, dear <laughs> God. At the other end of the scale, there can be uh, these very, very high quality, full dealership garages. So down the length of Chile, which is a very long country, the whole spine, you'll find garage after garage after garage, uh, which is a full quality dealership. This one happens to be in Brazil, it's just been built. And just to reassure you how good it can be, and I think this is the same for most marks, whether it's Toyota or whatever it might be, the supply chain is there and things do function. And we needed a windy door handle, just a little interior door handle, about five quid. So we wandered into this Mercedes garage, explained what we wanted. The guy went, okay, yeah, I'm very keen to practice his English. Typed in the computer, he said, yes, Mr. London, it'll be in um, Santiago in two weeks' time. Yeah, when you get up there, You'd be there in two weeks' time. It'd be there for you to collect. Walked into the parts department in Santiago. Oh, hello, Mr. Longdon, there's your door handle. Five quid later. So it just proved that that, that sort of supply chain thing That's is there. Job yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ah, ah, I didn't want to spoil the party. We talk about Land Rovers. Yeah, it's, um, you feel very left out not, not driving Land Rover over there. You know, the, the Germans have got them. And how was your trip? Oh, yes, I've replaced this and that. And now, you know, we've been stranded for six weeks here waiting for a transfer box. It's like, oh, God, okay. I think Land Rovers are quite problematic. And again, if you find I over Lander, you, you can find those specialists that will service your Land Rover for you and, and look after it. But, um, Right, um, a bit of a conclusion now. Um, I should say, <laughs> South America awaits you. It's beautiful, safe, and easy to get to. And we really do believe that. Um, if you want to buy us a beer afterwards, I can talk about one or two more sketchy things that happened, um, particularly around the police in Paraguay. But generally, it, it is as safe as you could wish to be. And I would say I feel safer over there than I do here. I had nothing stolen in South America, came back to the UK, you can guess it, yeah. Had something stolen. Um, it is easy to get to, uh, not a lot more difficult than going on a roll on, roll off um, ferry to France, really. Bit of paperwork, stick it on the boat, pick it up the other end. Um, what else? The language? Well, it's a giggle, it's a laugh, isn't it, really? You know, people want to speak English, that's the most annoying bit. You think, oh God, I want to practice my Spanish, and somebody will say, aha, I must practice my English. So there we are. Um, that bit should say any questions, but as it doesn't, we'll put a lovely sunset up there for you. So uh, that's it. Any questions, please? Oh, oh, I've got to ask. How many people are still tempted to go to South America? No. Oh, yes. <laughs> God, that would have been disastrous if no hands had gone up. Okay. Yeah, we're happy to take questions. Please, please. Did, did you find as you were going around that the, the, the dialect of the Spanish was very good question. Did we find as we went around that the dialect of the Spanish changed? Yes, tremendously. I'll give you some examples. Um, you will learn Spanish, Spanish probably on Duolingo. You go to Uruguay or Argentina, and you know the, the two L's. So let's take the word like we call them a llama, you know, the animal. Uh, in Spanish, you would call it a llama. In Uruguay or Argentinian Spanish, they pronounce the two L's like a sh. So it's a shama. And um, a street, a calle, becomes a cachet. Like, what? Not only have I learned Spanish, I've now got to learn this dialect. But that's about the only major difference. The, the Bolivia language schools are renowned for their standardized Latin American Spanish. They're very helpful. And the only problem we really encountered uh, was, um, oh my goodness, my other half's got the video running with a dodgy road, so I just felt a bit queasy there, um, is, is in Chile. We crossed the border from Argentina to Chile, and I have to say in Chile, they might as well have just been speaking Cantonese, and the other Latin American country said, we've no idea what they're talking about. 
So you, you, you know, you're not on your own there. So, oh, I'm tempted to hold this up and put you off there. <laughs> we'll show, we'll show you afterwards. Yeah. Any more questions? Well, you said obviously border crossings were quite challenging. Is, is you, I mean, general feedback is you know hand over copies of your original paperwork, don't hand over the actual thing. A bit of bribery here and there. How, how much bribery? Right. Excellent question. Um, so were border crossings is difficult? Um, do you hand over your original paperwork? Do you pay bribes? Uh, I'll run through those and dealing with the police, if that's okay. Okay. Uh, first thing, never ever hand over your original documents, because they may just go off for a coffee or just never come back. You know, They're a bit random. We went all the way around South America, and there's nobody here, on copy documents. We got the original, but there was no way I was handing them over. And um, in South America, I have to say, a colour photocopy is like, oh my God, a UFO might have landed. You know, they probably wouldn't believe you could have colour photocopy. And that sounds ridiculous, but yeah, so we went around and co copy documents, put them in a nice folder with some nice pages, you know, those nice clear plastic pages. It's, wow, this is really impressive, you know. Um, hand over your little, you know, stupid little international driving license. You get, you get seven quid from the post office. You think, what's that all about? They love that. Love it. Do you remember they're all about stamps and bureaucracy and more pages. Love all of that. Oh, yes. We, yeah, yeah, we weren't there. For, yeah, it w would be difficult. Yeah. Yeah, 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 there, yeah. Uh, absolutely, it's not rocket science, is it really? Yeah. Um, Obviously, so, at the borders, we yeah. had to hand over our original oh, passports, passports to yes. get them stamped. Obviously, yeah, 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 yeah hand, hand yeah. those over. Uh, in terms of bribes, um, because of my background, I hate corrupt police officers more than words could ever describe. There are no words to describe how much I hate them. I was not going to pay a penny to anybody, so I didn't. And it's like, uh, I, I, I'm going to tell you my attitude, really? Really? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I've got all day, I've got all week, you know. I said, like, oh, okay. So do the Paraguay story. Some people do pay bribes. Yeah, some people do pay bribes. I think generally younger folks that are, that are frightened of authority, not used to authority, go, okay, hand over $5, $10, and the cops live on that sort of stuff. So you will go, if you... Go the journey that we took around here, you will drive through thousands of police and military checkpoints. Many of them not manned, staffed. Some of them are. Some won't stop you. But we found ourselves, I don't know, tailgating trucks so we could just slip in behind them and get, get through before the little local person who's paid two dollars to lift the rope up could stop us. Um, oh, one interesting point, we're, we're right-hand drive, okay? Nobody had ever seen a right-hand drive vehicle. <laughs> and um, you've got kind of locals queuing up to be photographed in the seat, it's a bit weird. But the problem is, if you are a right-hand drive over there, this is how we understand the law, we're fairly certain about this, it is lawful to temporarily import your vehicle, which is what you do in each country, if you're right-hand drive. So you can take a right-hand drive in, as long as you're temporarily importing, but you can't permanently register the vehicle there. That's fair enough. The trouble is, the cops on the street are as thick as two short planks. They don't care about the law. They make it up anyway. And so if they think, OK, oh, so there's something about right-hand vehicles are dodgy. If they get it into their head that you can't be there, then they'll try and milk it for all they're worth. And we did have a problem with that in, in Paraguay, which meant we had to turn around and go back into Brazil. But having said that, Paraguay was going through a bit of a mini-coup, and the cops there were so, so corrupt. I was like, you can shove it. I'm not spending my tourist dollars here. In fact, we, we came across the roadblock of all roadblocks. It was the mother of all roadblocks. And, and Marilyn looked at them and went, oh, shit, oh, dear. And I felt the same. And so they pulled me out of the cab, detained me for an hour and a half, threatened me with violence, wanted $1,000. And the, and the guy said, look, we're corrupt cops. That's what we do. He wasn't bashful about it. There's a cash register there. That's what we do. You know, we'll just empty your pockets sort of thing. And, um, yeah, we managed to get out of that one. Having, we were very unlucky with that, yeah, uh, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We didn't meet anybody else who went to Paraguay who had the same experience. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, Sorry, what did, you, did, you, did you pay them? No, I didn't, didn't, didn't pay them a penny. I mean, I, I, it's around conversation management. It's like, I'm going to bore you to death and I'm going to take the conversation over here. And eventually, they go, OK, I'm out of here. This guy's crazy. You know? um, so, so, yeah, we, we, didn't, we didn't pay on that. We, we didn't pay any, any money anywhere. Um, Is that a victim in 
Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I think because they they rely on you being frightened, and it's like, what are you gonna do? Fill me in? Kill me? I don't care. It's like, okay, why? Well, <laughs> and that, that kind of wrong footed them a bit. And, and, and after a bit, it's like, thanks ever so much. I've had a lovely day, lovely, lovely time. I'm taking my documents. You know. There's a bit more that happened in the middle, but. So. Um, yeah, meanwhile, I was in the van in the baking heat with no aircon, etc just occasionally looking out to look at the body language to see what was happening. And I could hear him saying, very interesting in Spanish to what they were saying. And he looked very chilled. They were very aggressive and fed up. Meanwhile, they were popping out, getting $5 from various other people. But uh, he just stood there saying, very interesting. And eventually they just, I think, got fed up with him. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> indeed. Uh, um, and our techniques around the, uh, the roadblocks, so one thing is never, ever turn your engine off. And I know that from having worked as a cop. Gives you the psychological advantage. Never turn your engine off. Just keep that... I'm mobile. I'm ready to go. Once you turn it off, you're stuffed. And the other thing we did, being right-hand drive, uh, we did that like the locals do in the lorries. We put a kind of black mesh net at the front of the windscreens because the heat, the heat and the ultraviolet is so high. So the bottom third of the windscreen is covered with a black mesh net which surprisingly managed to cover up our steering wheel. <laughs> and uh, which led to all the cops stopping us, wandering around to Marilyn, and gave us some great comedy moments. I'm sat there and she's talking to them and said, right, show me your license. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I don't have my, have my license. She said, They're very puzzled. There was a bit of a macho stuff going on too. And, and uh, eventually I managed to diplomatically explain it was right-hand drive and my husband was driving and that was why I didn't have a license. And they decided to back off. But it was a bit hairy for a few minutes. They lose, they lose face, be embarrassed and just walk away. So a lot of the times the right-hand drive worked to our advantage. So I hope that's helped answer that. Some of the bureaucracy. And bureaucracy does work to your advantage in South America. It's just maddeningly frustrating but inconsistent. So when we left the country, we expected, oh God, searches, paperwork, customs officials were just so bored. They went, oh, whatever. It took 15 seconds to leave to, to export the vehicle. And there were two of us there, like, is that it? Yeah. They went, oh yeah, whatever. No, it was just like in Africa, like, um, you know, biros. Biros were like standard trade. Oh, right. Yes. And, and like yes, a, yes, a Casio yes. watch was like gold. Yeah. So, you know, forget 100 or 1,000 dollars, you can have old people's Casio watch. You can get through. So it's just, yeah. just, just, just little things like that that were great. Yeah. Just, it's not so much bribery, it's just, it's just bargaining or yeah, yeah, but, uh, but Bolivia is a bit different. Um, so it is technically legal to sell fuel to foreigners. Yeah. Um, so that, that's, that's that's quite fun. You've got a number of ways of getting around that. You've probably read all the forums, all the ways of doing it. One is to I don't know, screw some false number plates on from the garage. It'll lend you some because they've got cameras. They fill it up, and you go down the road, give them the false number plates back, um, pay them a bribe, all that sort of thing. Um, I, 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 I went for the shock and awe tactic and just drove straight in up to the pump, fill her up. So, okay. <laughs> and they did. We agreed a price. Thanks ever so much. I'm out of here. And they're happy because they've, they've made some money. And, uh, you know. and, and the, the final garage uh, coming out of Bolivia, bear in mind, it's completely legal to sell to foreigners unless you do this very complicated procedure, which nobody does. There were police sat there watching, watching the foreigners fill up with fuel. Of course, they just take their cut on it afterwards. So everything's possible in South America, a bit like Africa, I guess. Yeah. Um, can I just say that insurance? Did you have like mercantile insurance? Oh, insurance, yeah. Um, very straightforward. Um, there's a little guy in a back street somewhere in uh, Buenos Aires. We'll do it by email for you, which covers all the Mercosur countries. So that's a bit like the European kind of equivalent. That's those covered. For those countries that aren't uh, within that agreement, Dead easy. Go to the border, find somebody with a little booth, and say, "Hello, I'd like some insurance for my van." Um, Iovalander will tell you exactly the coordinates, the people to go to that are reputable, and the prices are just ridiculous. Um, in Peru, I think it was thirteen U.S. dollars. We got a year's insurance and a beautiful laminated card with a hologram and a photograph and a little plastic container. I was delighted. Yeah, what use it is, I don't know. Yeah. <coughs> Okay, uh, cash and transactions, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we took a lot of US dollars with us, and I mean a lot of US dollars. So we, we used cash, cash is king, cash works everywhere. Ecuador is a, 
a US dollar economy, so take some uh, cash with you. If you want to know a completely foolproof way to carry cash, I'll tell you about it confidentially afterwards. I promise that you don't tell anybody else. Um, yeah. So the, uh, the ATMs, the banking system, is not as we know it. In Argentina, there were queues of maybe up to 200 people on the ATMs. And you go into the bank and there'd be go, oh, no, I've run out of money. Bank's closed, go away. So it's worth carrying a bit of cash. But I paid for all of our fuel, apart from Bolivia, where it was all cash and backhanders, with credit card. I think almost all of our shopping we paid with, uh, where we could, with, with, with credit cards. You know. Yeah, it's kind of, yeah, it is, you know, it's really quite, quite developed in that sense. You didn't obviously know the credit card scamming. Uh, credit card scamming, bless them, I don't think they could do it if they tried. Really, honestly. It was quite, it was quite hopeless, you know. Um, yeah. 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 Right, the, the North East, it's a very good question. So you see the route covers down there. Um, two reasons. Uh, the first one, well, Venezuela's broken. I really wanted to go around there. I wanted to go through Venezuela, come down to the river, go out to the sea and back down again. So Venezuela's broken. Uh, and the second one was um, Brazil is huge. You know, it probably deserves a year on its own. So it was, we just cut through, had a sample of Brazil uh, and came home. But Brazil was on our list of, yeah, that's somewhere to go back to. And then there's those odd little random countries dotted around the edge, you know, British Guiana, all, all that sort of thing. They're probably a bit odd. You need to get a boat probably to some of these things, and we're two-wheel drive, and it's a bit wet. A whole load of other reasons, but it was okay. It was enough for a sample. And the bottom bit of Brazil, um, <laughs> it gave us the experience of Portuguese, which I would describe as something like a Russian-speaking Chinese, but chewing soft bread at the same time. Uh, yeah, or Klingon, yeah, completely indecipherable. And there's plenty of variety in Brazil, so we had you know, a bit of mountain, flat plains with the cattle, jungles, yeah, and see. Yeah. Um, so the driving time was about six months, seventeen thousand miles. I know, I know, it's ridiculously fast. I'm embarrassed about that, but it was just a sample to get a sense of it. And so some of the roads are long, straight roads. You can put some miles on during a day. Um, I, well, I would put a caveat to that. I didn't feel I could ever once take my eyes off the road for more than one second because of holes, dips, and bumps in the road unexpected things like oh, the road engineering is just not like over here so you, my most frightening point was driving down a dual carriageway at about 60 miles an hour around about about a mile away you know you think oh, I'll just take my foot off the gas and I'll just kind of get her to go in without going too hard on the brakes and we'll, yeah, we'll just set the vehicle up for the roundabout and go up the hill not looking at the 100 metres in front of me <laughs> unbelievably on a dual carriageway there are manhole covers can you believe that? What a manhole cover's made out of? Steel. Steel's got a value. So somebody's taken the manhole covers. And it was just the last minute, it was like, oh, dear God. And the, the reality is, all the other motorists around you, all of them will know that road. They will all know the dips and bumps. Oh gosh, um, better mention the road humps as well. Um, anybody who's driven in Mexico will know about this. The rumpy moles, the braking bumps, they put them everywhere. You can put them outside your house, you don't like the speed of the traffic, you put a bump there. Every town puts a bump there, every village puts a bump there, so we must have driven over, I don't know, 10,000, 50,000 of these damn things, and I'll just put them on a dual carriageway, and it would smash your vehicle to pieces, so you could be in 60 miles an hour, and somebody just thinks, oh, do you know what, rather than put traffic lights or a bridge or a flyover, we'll just put a speed hump on this dual carriageway. Everybody else knows about it, and they all go, okay, yeah, I think we're all done for time, so that's why I've got to concentrate. Any more questions? I think we're all done. Yeah, and some pictures at the back if you want to just have a little holiday snaps of South America. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. We'll be back shortly at Adventure Overland 2017 with another Travel Times Talks. But for now, do check out any of our other videos. And of course, as always, a big thanks to Rimmer Brothers who have partnered with us to bring you these talks. Their new popular parts catalogue is available for all Land Rover vehicles and is a great addition to your glove box. For more information also, do check out www.rimmerbrothers.co.uk.